Good one, Ely. Good work by Ely. Brought down at the finish and across. But chance for Hewitt. Yes! Yes, a good goal by Hewitt. 21 minutes of the second half. Chesterfield go into the lead. So, so kind of as a as Chesterfield born and bred, what was your first experience of uh, of Chesterfield? And was that your boyhood team? Uh, yes, yes. Um, following, yeah. I mean, obviously, you look at the uh, the Liverpool's of that era and teams like that. When I was growing up in the uh, sort of got into football, well, quite an early age, play football, but sort of mid seventies hmm. mainly. And then, obviously, uh, the teams like your Liverpool core match of the day. But um, I used to go. My dad used to take me playing football, sort of most Saturdays, Saturday afternoons when I was a youngster and um, practicing football. And uh, one day I just turned around and said, can we go watch Chesterfield? Um, and I used to watch a bit of local football. My dad was from Stavely, well, Barra Hill, up that way. So we used to watch a bit of local football while I was kicking a ball about. And um, I think my dad's first initial thought was, yeah, but you're not you're not be able to run around outside of the pitch, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> uh, you have to sit in the stand and watch the game. Um, and I was only quite young. I was four or five, I think. Um, as I say, mid-70s. Well, early 70s. And um, we went to our first game at, at um, Saltergate. Um, we, we used to sit in the um, the wing stand, the, um, the cross street wing stand. So it was the sort of the end, closer to the away fans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just above the tunnel, really. We used to sit up there. And um, I got hooked from that age. I went to watch the first game. Um, and I, I think I did find it quite hard to sit down for the full 90 minutes. Really young, so I wanted to be uh, kicking a ball about. But um, we sat through that one and I was hooked. I just loved live football and um, the atmosphere he got from Chesterfield and uh, my hometown team. So I was yeah. a supporter ever since, really. And who, who were your favourite players, kind of? Do you remember who, who the people were that you idolised? Yeah, I mean, sort of when I first started watching, um, as I say, I probably took more of an interest sort of mid 70s around then and you had um, Steve Grozovic in the net um, Ricky Heppler um, people players like that of the era um, we were, I remember John Cotton at the back and then later on obviously as Arthur Cox sort of got in and bought the, the dream team really in the team of um, Alan Birch Alan Crawford um, Ernie Moss obviously a, a great stalwart and a friend and um, you just watching him play football was was amazing, and um, everybody on those lines: uh, Bill Green, John Ridley, um, the keepers, Phil Tingey, I was a Chesterfield lad, and um, just that era, that era of football. Just Danny Wilson came in, and I mean they were the dream team then, and that was a team that got everybody excited. So sort of then, and I was really get really into the football then. You see, because I was a bit older. So, so then I suppose then you start kind of playing a lot of football as well uh, as a kid. When, when did you, did you ever like think that you were quite good at football? Because <laughs> I've always wondered that about people that go into like youth teams and things. Did you actually, were you better than everyone else? <laughs> well, um, I, w- I wouldn't say I was an amazing footballer. I wouldn't say people would look at me in a team and say, wow, he's going to make a pro or anything like that in football. I mean, I used to play a lot. I mean, we used to go to all the way home games. We didn't go to the away games so much. We went to a few when I got older. So then the Saturday when Chesterfield were away was spent on the field with my dad um, practising my football and um, he used to try and teach me things. Um, and then, obviously, the main thing sort of that era was sort of your school football, especially at primary, primary school, um, was mainly your school football that you played. You didn't sort of start like they do now, under sevens, under eights. It was sort of... The only football he had was school. And yeah, I was I was a decent player at school, um, in the school team. We had a good team. Um, Highfield Hall, it was in New World. Um, we had a decent team. But then they didn't have sort of a team until the last last year of football, really, at that school. So you were about 10 when you started playing uh, competitively against other schools. Um, but as it went from there, sort of, I got a trial for what was Chesterfield Boys, it was called then, which was um, an under 11s, the last year of your primary school. Um, I got in that team, um, not not a regular player to be fair, but I sub quite a lot and uh, 
obviously the best players around the Chesterfield area from the schools were in that team. Um, and then when we finished, we play obviously you play teams like Derby and teams like that. But when, when that year finished, all the parents got together and um, kept the king, team together as um, as like a young club have been an under eleven, under twelve team. They uh, one of the parents took over as manager, and uh, we got sponsored by a, a local a local um, bakery at the top of Newball Road, which was Mother's <laughs> Pride in those days which wasn't too far from where I lived, actually. So we were called Mother's Pride, under-11s, under-12s. I'm a happy knocker upper and I'm popular beside Cause I wake them with a cuppa And tasty Mother's Pride Then they're off in a flash and a rush The bread and a dash and a push The bread with a flash and a dash and a rush and a push Like I said, it's the bread It's the Mother's Pride bread It makes them love work They're going berserk to get off the work It's in the way I wake them by bringing to the side the bread we freshly bake on. Fantastic Mother's Pride. And then to the local Rousey League. Uh, obviously, we had a decent team because it was a Chesterfield boys team, so we, we tended to do quite well in that uh, in that league. Um, playing our home games uh, at Sheepery Sports Field, which, uh, again, was only a stone's throw from my house. I used to go down there most evenings with uh, friends playing football. So, um, good memories. And... Um, we had a decent team. We had a good team then of uh, of young lads. And I say I was just probably an average player in that team. I was uh, I just loved football. Probably one thing that I had was um, maybe my passion for football. And as time gets, you get a bit older, and uh, things come to distract you from playing football. I, I always used to like the football and used to love the taking part and playing football sort of thing. So I think that uh, that helped me along the way quite a lot. What position were you when you were in those teams? Um, I was tended to be more up front. I think uh, everybody liked the uh, idea of scoring goals <laughs> and uh, had a, a decent decent kick on me, decent shot on me. Um, when I went to Mother's Pride, when we had that team, I was playing more sort of left midfield, left wing. Um, never brilliant on my left foot, but uh, it did seem to suit me that I could uh, cut inside onto my right foot and have a, have a bit of a shot every now and then. But uh, mainly sort of up front and... Um, either centre forward or on a on a wing sort of thing, which uh, you tended to sort of everybody tended to sort of want to play those positions anyway when you were younger. Yeah. <laughs> so then, so then, did, like a dream of playing for Chesterfield, did that did that ever feel at that time like it was a it could be a reality? Yeah, uh, I don't know about reality, but it was always a dream. So obviously, you go to the games, and I mean the the major thing I remember obviously from a lot of Chesterfield games was when you went you used to go to a night game and the floodlights was on that was that was brilliant it was sort of one thing you want to do is run out because I always wanted to play on Salty Gate so it was amazing and wanted to run out under the floodlights and play um, play there um, at I went every other week to watch uh, watch um, Chesterfield and that was my dream to play there and um as, as time went on, I say the Mother's Pride team moved on and then we eventually got, because we were probably one of the best teams around, obviously the Chesterfield area, we got taken over by, um, we were sort of classed then, they didn't have academies then, you see, a football club. So we were sort of classed as um, Chesterfield Football Club's nursery team. Hmm. And a few a few came, came out to look at us. I think Bill Green came one day, I think he was trying to get, he moved on to the coaching side um, when he stopped playing and... Um, uh, Harold Roberts and people like that came out to see what we were like as a team and um, eventually we changed our name to Saltergate Athletic which uh, was Chesterfield's nursery team which was again fantastic for young boys to be playing there we used to go down and train at the ground um, one night a week or sometimes a couple of nights a week under the stand and uh, round the pitch and train at um, Eckington at Pitt Street um, which were um, a lot of the not being disrespectful, the older fans will remember uh, um, <laughs> Pitt Street. It was uh, Chesterfield on ground and um, floodlights on and a good little training ground for a club of Chesterfield stature in that era. Mm. Um, unfortunately sold now for building land, but that's where we used to play our home games and um, did quite a lot of training up there because they had the floodlights up as well. So that was uh, that was fantastic for all the, uh, all the young lads in that team to sort of play the Chesterfield's nursery team to had a link to sort of Chesterfield Football Club. And then how did that then kind of progress into you 
signing pro terms. Yeah, well, um, when you go on there, there used to be a, a thing where, a form where they used to sign, they, they were called associate schoolboy forms, when you got to around about 14, I think. So they come out and they offered most of the team, I think, a quite majority of the team signed associate schoolboy forms at that time. And then we were linked to the football club where in the school holidays they took us in for training um, and things like that. Uh, down we used to train at Highfield Park. Um, when the f- first team had finished playing, we'd go in and do um, a little bit of training through the holidays and night times. And then um, when you were about to leave school at the age of 16, um, you write a letter into the football club um, saying, look, I've been playing, I'm social school boy, I've been playing for the nursery team for a few years, I would like to be considered for an apprenticeship, uh, which was an apprenticeship stroke, YTS, just starting off in um, 1984. Um, and I remember taking my letter up to the local post box because <laughs> um, it was the only thing I wanted to do. I couldn't really think of uh, anything I mean, I remember all the teachers and the careers officers sort of saying, um, well, what if you don't do the football? What else do you want to do? And I'm thinking, well, well I want to do the football. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> no, I didn't have a backup plan. I suppose I was only 15, 15 stroke 16 at that time, leaving school. Um, and I was like, well, I'll give football a shot. And then if that doesn't work, I'll uh, have to think of something else. But uh, I remember taking a letter up to the post box that I'd written. John Duncan was the manager at the time. Um, and it was addressed to John Duncan. I think uh, I think I actually gave it a little kiss actually the letter before I put it in the um, in the letterbox because it meant so much sort of thing and um, dropped it in and I've got the letter actually that uh, John sent back um, at the time um, because I was uh, clearing a loft out at my parents a few years ago and um, I found what my dad had saved the letter and John had written back. Um, well, yes, we know you're associate schoolboy, and we're watching all the schoolboys, all the uh, all the football team, um, and obviously, if you keep playing well and if you're good enough, we'll offer you an apprenticeship. So basically, they didn't really tell me anything; just said I'm going to keep playing, playing the best I can, and then uh, see how it goes. So then, luckily, after that, um, we got to close to the end of the season, and there were a few of us out of the team. Um, I can't remember how many. Uh, one, two, three maybe five or six who were offered um, YTS apprenticeships at, uh, at the football club. And then they brought a few more in, players who they've been watching probably around the Sheffield Leagues and that. And I think we had, I think we had about 11, 11 um, first, uh, first year apprenticeship, uh, YTS apprentices at, um, at the football club. So um, we had a few second years at that time, but they'd been whittled down through the season. So that made the squad for the youth team really. Hmm. So did you ever get to train with the with the senior squad? Were you mixed in? Um, yeah, pretty separate. Yeah, I mean, we were all, it was, I mean, it's hard to hard to sort of envisage now on the, um, also the different uh, setups now where big teams have youth teams who train on their own pitches and then the first team. We were sort of all, all mucking in together. It was sort of, we were, we did all the jobs. We had to... Um, the, the apprentices were in early in the morning, getting all the kit ready for the first team, putting all that out, cleaning the dressing room, cleaning the bathrooms, making sure, making sure everything was spotless, um, training balls, getting everything ready, um, things like that. And then um, we'd all sort of go up. We had a, an old van that uh, Kev Randall used to drive us up in. And then the first team would train. And some of us would be, if they needed numbers, would be looking enough to train with the first team. If not, we'd be off doing a little bit on our own. And then um, as the first team training session probably came to an end of the shooting session, we ended up fetching balls for them. And uh, if they missed the target and getting feeding the balls back into play. And then usually our main training session would be all together maybe in the afternoon when the first team had gone home, you see. So uh, it was, and then we'd clean up everything for the, uh, for the next day. But uh, that was sort of the, the gist of it. And we used to play on, um, on Saturdays. We'd play at home. We were lucky enough to play. We got one of my dreams on um, Saltergate, obviously, was a young kid. We used to play our home games when the first team were away on a Saturday afternoon. So, uh, and we played at the weekend, trained through the week, obviously, yeah. And then, kind of debut for the first team time. Or, am I right? It was, that was away at Plymouth? Yes, yes. I was, um, again, we, we'd gone through the first year of the apprenticeship. Um, 
playing quite a few, quite a few good teams, local teams. Um, we they put us in a men's league where we played um, Arnold Town, Budweiser Victoria. We sort of played their reserves, um, and obviously that toughened us up quite a lot because they were men's teams who didn't like getting run around by um, a bunch of 16, 17 year old kids. So they used to put the boot in and uh, try and beat us that way. And um, it was a, a good upbringing sort of into football. So we had our first year. Um, and then I think there were three, three or four of us moved on. Definitely three of us moved on to the second year. Um, there was myself, Andy Taylor, Andy Wood, um, who moved up. Then they were, they were all Chesterfield lads who obviously played in Chesterfield Boys with myself. And, uh, and then the second year, um, I just seemed to kick on quite well in pre-season and through the season playing at the youth team. And the first year, I was maybe lucky to get a second year. I wouldn't say I was top of the tree. I wouldn't say I was top of the pile then. But uh, after the break through the summer, I came back. I seemed to kick on quite well. Um, had a good pre-season. Um, got to train with the first team quite a lot, um, where most of us did, being sort of second years. And then um, I remember there was a game away at Plymouth, as you say. And um, at that time of day, at that time of the... 86, I think it was, was um, only one sub. There was only one sub in games. Um, and we were travelling down to Plymouth and I was the 13th man, so a spare rider, basically, a bit of experience going down. And um, I think it was David Batty. I think he took ill on the bus going down. It wasn't very well. Um, so Kevin Randall was sort of my mentor. Um, I was scared to say for John, the manager at that time, because I was a young lad and uh, mm-hmm. he was the first team manager. But uh, Kev came up and said, um, you're sub today. Um, don't worry about it. Just take it all in, get, get the atmosphere. And um, so I was, that was my first really total involvement with the first team, being um, 12th man, the substitute at Plymouth. Uh, went through the first half, uh, Steve Spooner got injured, twisted his ankle, and they brought me on at half-time, 46 minutes. Um, what's, what's, what's going through your head then when you think? Are you, oh, well. <laughs> are you like in a bit of panic mode? <laughs> yes, you're yeah, extremely yeah. nervous. Um, I've got good, experienced pros around me, Steve Baines, um, Steve Scrimger, Ernie Morse, Bob Newton, a lot of experienced players um, I don't quite remember who was a keeper whether it was Jim or Chris probably Chris Marples actually mm. and um, loud but helpful helpful to a, to a young lad coming in so they're all I'm going on by this time my position had moved to sort of right back um, played a couple of seasons there and um, that's where that's where obviously they put me in the game playing right back I think I don't know whether the score was 1-1 when I came, when it was at half-time. I think it was 1-1 at Plymouth. Um, and it stayed 1-1 until the end. So that was a massive relief for me yeah. <laughs> that um, I didn't go on at half-time and we, uh, we I did anything to contribute to us getting beat or losing the game. But yeah, I was nervous and I think the, the, big, the big players, the big personalities helped me and obviously they, didn't, they gave me some early touches of the ball. Um, they didn't shield me they made sure made sure I got the ball and um, did stuff with it and defended the best I could and um, yeah we went on for a, for a 1-1 so and that's quite a pleased pleasure. with the debut it's a long journey back home to kind of take it all in <laughs> yeah yeah just sat on back home and obviously um, no mobile phones or anything like that so that wouldn't have been pinging out to wait until I got home for uh, obviously my parents didn't travel all that way down there I mean they were very supportive of me and went to most of my games but uh I was meant to be 13th man, and, uh, and but um, to uh, to get that under my belt and do okay, did okay, and uh, and for a 45 minute stint, that uh, I was uh, very pleased and um, very excited. Wanted some more, really. Yeah, starts you on that road. And yeah, then if I if I whiz forward a few years, I kind of wanted to mention it. Uh, go with the highs and the lows, but there's the Gillingham uh, defeat. Yeah, the ten nil. Yes. Now, um, yeah. <laughs> you, were you the sub? Um, I was that day. So I was. So I would. I'd been injured. Um, 
as I say, just going obviously after the debut, there was a bit of a break, and then obviously I became a bit of a regular towards the end of uh, end of the season. And then I started the next season. Uh, John had moved on to Ipswich, and uh, Kevin Kevin Randall had taken over as manager. Um, and I I got injured. Um, I think it was a Friday before a game, or I got injured in a game, and I, I twisted my ankle and I hadn't played for a while. And uh, we'd had a, a decent start to the season. I don't think I think up until then I don't know whether we'd conceded a goal. Yeah, I was looking yeah. at it this morning. It, it was. Uh... Hardly letting, letting yeah. go, well, maybe maybe the odd one, but yeah, we've got um, a very good defense record, and um, I was coming back. I, not to use excuses that we got beat ten nil. I don't know whether I was a hundred percent fit, but I strapped my ankle up and I was on the way to fitness. I was more or less there. Um, so Kevin put me on the bench, and uh, it was just a, a total nightmare game. To be honest, <laughs> I mean. Um, the only highlight of it is it. I think uh, we wore a lovely kit. We wore a lovely white, uh, white away kit with uh, pinstripes in it that we never wore after that game. To be honest, we kept through it in the bin. So there was special interest in the first viewing of the huge victory, which rewrote the Gillingham record books. A flying start. Howard Pritchard scoring in the second minute. <laughs> 12 minutes later, it was Pritchard again with a header. The third goal after 31 minutes, a solo run from the bustling Shearer. Five minutes before half-time, 4-0, a piece of opportunism from the former Charlton midfield player, George Shipley. Another midfield man, Carl Elsie, ran through for the fifth. Chesterfield goalkeeper Jim Brown by now struggling with a hamstring injury. We turned up at Gillingham. Always a tough game against Gillingham. A long way to go. And um, I'll never forget it. Lee Rogers, another good friend who I spent many a year at Chesterfield with. Um, a, a legend at Chesterfield, played a lot of games, Lee. Um, was playing left back. That was his customary role, left back. And um, they had a winger. His name escapes me a little bit there. And Kev said, look, he loves to go on the outside, get crosses in. Um, show him inside. Show him onto his weaker foot inside. So, um, I think, strangely, in the game, we kicked off. I think Andy Taylor was playing in this one. I think we kicked off and we had a decent chance from the kickoff to go 1-0 up. Um, I think the keeper saved it or, or we might have just missed it or whatever. But then they went down and um, Lee Rogers did exactly as Kev showed, <laughs> showed him inside. And um, this winger, I don't know whether it was, I can't remember his name or stuff, as I say, but he unleashed this shot with his so called weaker foot, left foot, and it flew straight into the top corner. <laughs> and Lee Rogers looked at Kevin and went, You told to show him inside. <laughs> he said, don't worry about it, stick to the plan, show him inside. So we kicked off, I think we lost the ball again, straight out to this winger, ran at Lee again, cut inside, left foot, bang, top corner again. <laughs> so Kev shouts on. Lee, forget it, join that line. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on the bench and we're thinking, flipping it, there's about four minutes gone, we're 2 0 down here. And I think Jim Jim got injured, Jim Brown. He was in the nets. I think he pulled his hamstring. Mm. And uh, he wasn't moving that freely. But I remember at half time, it was, uh, it was 5 0 at half time. And Kev was like, we've just got to damage limitation. We've we're not going to win the game. We're five nil down. So he said, he turned to me and said, uh, are you okay to go on? I said, yeah, yeah. So I think he took maybe a striker off. I don't think I wanted to go on at yeah, five nil. Where did you want to go on at five nil down? <laughs> not really. I was going to play the ankle card, I think. But uh, I, th I went on and um, I think we had, we played more or less double full backs. Just, well, second, every shot they had just went in. And um, in hindsight, I mean, I have uh, been in the nets a couple of times for the first team and uh, on a couple of occasions when needs must. And in hindsight, maybe Jim would have been better coming off and putting somebody else in the nets because he couldn't kick the ball, he couldn't really move very well. Um, and if uh, he would have probably put me in. Uh, so I might have kept it to eight, you never know. Yeah. But, uh, 
<laughs> but it was, yeah, it was a low point. It was uh, an embarrassing, embarrassing point to lose that many and sort of create history, unwanted history. But what, um, what did they say in the? What did you say in the dressing room after something like that? Do you just not say anything and just? There's not much you can say. I don't think. I mean, uh, you. If anything, I think. We, we didn't find it funny, we didn't, uh, but it's sort of, look, there's nothing we can say, get showered, get on the bus, just keep your head down, train hard for a week and try and turn it around next week because it is it is a low point, it is embarrassing. Um, my only saving grace was I was on the bench <laughs> <laughs> for the start of the game. But uh, it, was, it was just one of those, Jim got injured and every shot they hit went in. I mean, they probably had, 11, 12 shots during the game and 10 went in. I mean, we've had plenty of games where you've had 12 shots in the game and you've got a nil at the end of it. But uh, it's an unwanted, unwanted memory, really, that one, the, uh, the Gillingham one. Uh, I saw a video on, on YouTube of um, Keith Peacock, who was the Gillingham manager, and he used to give his give his players odds of scoring at the yeah. uh, before every match, and he said it cost yeah. him about 150 quid. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, it will have done because I think he, uh, as I say, our defensive record was really good, really good up until then, on goals conceded, and they won the week before. They beat Southend 8-1 the week before, Gillingham. So, again, I mean... Kev, Kev, Randall, Kev, Kev was my mentor, was my, my footballing dad, and I've, I've always called him. He, um, I wouldn't have had a career without, uh, without Kev. Um, but he, he came in again, another little little chuckle, really, and said, well, it, it's good, really, they've scored eight against Southend, because they'll, they'll use all the goals up. <laughs> so we never let him forget that, either. <laughs> Uh, because obviously they scored 18, they scored 10 against us, 8 against them. But uh, Kev says, well, they must use all the goals up scoring eight. Um, but that was not to be. But that kit was um, never used again. It um, it was a lovely kit as well, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, not, on, not, not on that day. It wasn't used <laughs> after that. Such an extravagant performance did leave manager Keith Peacock with mixed feelings. As a pre-match gimmick, he'd given each player odds against scoring. It became a very costly managerial exercise. But you see, for poor Chesterfield, the writing really was on the wall. It was just something on the spur of the moment when I came in the dressing room before the game. I've been thinking how uh, well Chesterfield have been doing as regards not conceding any goals at all. Uh, we'd won 8-1 the week before and I honestly thought, well, this is going to be a really tight game. Perhaps if we sneak it 1-0 or something like that, two at the most, um, that would be the result. And uh, so I thought I could be a bit generous and give them odds against scoring in division. I just came and I, I put this up on the board and, and I said the maximum bets would be uh, a pound, two pound at the most. And uh, it seemed to take their interest and the money was out there pretty quick and they all had a bet on themselves, or most of them did. And unfortunately, from a financial point of view, um, they took me absolutely to the cleaners. I, oh, wow. Well, it was close to 150 quid, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, I never expected a, a result like that. I mean, 10 nil. I mean, it couldn't have worked out worse from the bookmaker's point of view. But from a managerial point of view, I was really pleased. And then, if we was forward a, a fair bit again, you did mention near the start you had a, um, a season at Doncaster. Um, yeah. Was that... Obviously, it, was, it would have been a massive disappointment been released did it come out of the blue or, or did you get a sense that it was going to happen uh no it came out of the blue to me to be totally honest um obviously we've wished forward a bit time has moved on um chris McMenamin, well paul hart came um first mm -hmm. uh and then obviously chris took over i mean when paul came i was recovering from glandular fever in a way um i've been struck down with glandular fever um and then Kev Randall departed and um, Paul came in and I think I was lucky enough to have a two-year contract because I think I would probably might have been released. I could see the writing on the wall there because Paul was obviously bringing his own players in. Um, but then I started the second season. I started quite well. He'd moved me up into midfield. Um, and on my first game, I think I played Birmingham in the Cup when Paul was there, I managed to score. And um, I scored eight goals that season uh, from midfield. We got to Wembley. Um, unfortunately lost to a Dion Dublin Dion Dublin header 
um, which everyone does know in Chesterfield that was never a corner what he scored off but uh, mm-hmm. the referee gave a corner <coughs> and then um, we had a bad start to the next season Paul got the sack and uh, Chris took over I mean I played 40 games that season I think for Chesterfield mm-hmm. um, mainly midfield a few in, few at full back uh, Lee Francis would come in then at full back um, from Arsenal um, and I was playing midfield and I would, I would say I played 40 odd games and my contract was up I uh, went in to see Chris to discuss another one. It wasn't a great season for Chesterfield. I mean, I think we were just a mediocre team that season. And um, we just said, we can't offer you a contract. Uh, we've got to trim the squad or whatever. And I'm afraid you're one of the casualties. Um, and that, yeah, that was that hurt. It was a bit of disappointment for me, to be fair, because to play that many games um, for Chesterfield in that season and even leading up from, from, um, from my debut, my full debut against Derby County at home, except for a few injuries, being quite irregular in the team, was, uh, yeah, it was quite hard to take. It was uh, a very low point in my career. Hmm. How did it How did it come about then, going to, to Doncaster? Was that a... Um, when, you're, when, when you haven't been offered a contract, basically released by the club, they uh, circulate your name, your name goes on a big database, go around other clubs. Um, so... Just to put my name on there, and basically, I just uh, just sat tight, sat home, uh, waited for the phone to ring um, to see what uh, to see what would come. And um, I think the first team to call me was Telford, hmm. um, who were probably in the equivalent of the National League now, I think, something like that. Uh, they rang me. Um, I had a good chat with them. Didn't go down to see them. Just a phone phone call at the time, uh, and they were paying good money. Um, for training two nights a week and playing football, there, were, there was some decent money in non league football. Uh, but ideally, I wanted to stay in the football league if I could. Um, I explained this and they, they kept the offer open. They were really good. Um, then I got a call from Doncaster from Steve Beagle Hall and uh, John Ward was his assistant. So I went up there. They asked me to go up to Doncaster, obviously not far away. So I went up and had a chat. Um, and they offered me a year's contract up there. They were not a rich club, Doncaster. They were, what are they? I get mixed up with all the leagues now. They're equivalent to League Two again. So they were no bottom half League Two team. They were, um, and they offered me, I say, a contract, um, decent money. They're travelling up there and uh, whatever. So I looked at that and then I got a call out of the blue from um, Stockport, from Dana Bagara who were in the playoffs then in equivalent to League One to go up to the Championship. They were in the playoffs. And he said, if we just get the playoffs out of the way, I, um, I'd like to get you to Stockport, if I could. And that that'd be, that was a massive move, really, if they'd have gone into Championship. <coughs> Excuse me. I think they lost their playoffs, actually. But uh, still a league above, above where we were. But we couldn't sort anything out in the end. It was um, a six-month contract he offered me, so not a lot of stability and... Stuff like that. So I went back to Doncaster and accepted their offer, really. Um, and there were a few of us who travelled up in a car, sort of met at Junction 29. So we had a nice little car school. Like Chesterfield player Steve Prindable. He was in that one, uh, car school. And we travelled up to Doncaster. And, uh, yeah, I enjoyed my time there, to be honest. I enjoyed... I was um, sort of out of the town sort of way he played, so... Maybe, maybe not as much pressure. I mean, obviously, I was always a Chesterfield lad and always looked for Chesterfield scores. I mean, it was the worst bit of that season was playing against Chesterfield, I think. <laughs> as I say, there's, um, there's obviously kind of pros and, and cons to being a, uh, a product of the kind of local academy and, and coming through um, to actually go into somewhere completely fresh, isn't there? This, I suppose players, fans want to see kind of their own kids from the local area coming through, don't they? Um, but at the same time, there's something, I don't know, exotic about <laughs> signing someone from further afield as well. Did you get a, a kind of a different taste of it at Doncaster? Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a different taste. Um, I mean, we didn't pull any trees up. <laughs> we, weren't, um, we weren't the worst team in the league, but we weren't the best. We were sort of a mediocre side. Uh, but um, it was, yeah, it was, it was nice to sort of, be sort of, if, I, if I was in Chesterfield, like you were mentioning, the 10-0 Gillingham, if you go out in town after then, yeah, everybody's asking you, well, what happened there? 10-0 and you get some steak. And 
you come home from another game at Doncaster, go out in Chesterfield, you don't, you don't really get asked about football, you see. So maybe it was a bit, bit easier in that way. Um, but as I say, playing playing against Chesterfield was a tough one. Coming to especially coming to Saltergate, sitting in the away changing room was a, was a very weird feeling. And, but I did enjoy the time at Doncaster, and I, I believe I think it did me good. I think I probably maybe grew up a little bit, and uh, I think I came back a better player to Chesterfield. Yeah, and it was um, it was John Duncan that brought you back, wasn't it? So yeah. So did you ever think that you'd get a chance to play for Chesterfield again? Was that a bit of a Probably not, no. I mean, I'll be totally honest. Uh, I, as I say, I, I was I started my second season at Doncaster. I got another contract for another year. And um, I started quite well. I was playing some good football in the second year. I got an injury in my first season, but uh, I was playing quite well at Doncaster. And um, and things sort, of worked, things sort of went right in the behind the scenes at Doncaster. There was a lot of ruckus and sort of chairman bringing his own players in and leaving sort of some of the other ones out who we thought were better than what they were bringing in. And uh, I sat down with the manager there <coughs> and um, I said, look, I don't think I'm going to play a big part now. I think you're going to bring more players in. Um, would you consider letting me go on a free? Uh, at first he said no, which I was a bit disappointed at because uh, I'd been, I'd nipped down the football club and I'd had a quiet word with Kevin Randall. Um, at the time, say, look, I'm looking to leave Doncaster. If there's any uh, anything going here, any chance you need a, a right back who was a bit better than when he left, <laughs> if you've got any spaces. And Kev says, look, I'll see what I can do. We are looking to build a new team to bring different players in um, to obviously gain promotion. Um, leave it with me. And then um, I went to see the manager again at Doncaster and he says, look, I'll see what I can do for you. You don't cause me any problems, blah, 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 blah. And um, about a week later, they came in and said, Chesterfield won't take no loan. Um, we're bringing, I think Lee Turnbull was coming up from Chesterfield to Doncaster and me and David Moss were coming down to uh, to Chesterfield. Um, and they, I think I got a loan deal on on a Friday. I think I signed all sales and delivered on a Friday just for a month's loan. And Kev says, look, We've done it on a loan. It says, again, it's basically a month trial. You've got to do well and we'll try and get you a contract. Yeah. And then and then it all kind of worked out because of a few years down the line, you're obviously in a Wembley final, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, when I came, there were me, Dave Moss came, um, and John Duncan was well known for, he always built from the back. He wanted a good, good sound defence. A good uh, good structure to the team, and then um, Bill from there. But Nicky Law, Laurie Madden, um, we had Sean Dyche, obviously from Paul Hart days. He was fancy himself as a midfielder then, but uh, they soon moved him back to uh, to a hard nut of a centre half. And uh, John built a team again that didn't concede many goals. And I think as John's philosophy was. If you don't concede so many, you've got a chance in every game. And um, that proved right for Chesterfield. Yeah, I came back, uh, as I say, from Doncaster then. And we missed out on the playoffs that season. And then the season after the 94-95, we, uh, we had a good season, yeah. A bad start to the season, actually, but uh, we'll finish well. I was going to say, it's a, like a classic example of momentum, isn't it, that, that season? Yeah. We kind of finished, yeah. hit form at the right time. Yeah, I mean, um, as I say, we were poor for, for the team we'd got. We were probably poor or just jelly, I don't know. But we were poor for the first first few months of the season until November time, uh, which which culminated in the Mansfield game, to be fair. Uh, <coughs> strangely enough, the Mansfield, uh, I think it was Mansfield away, where we got beat. It might have been 4-2. And... Um, we were all, obviously, it don't matter what sort of uh, season you're having, whether you're top of the league, bottom of the league, whatever, you lose to Mansfield, it's uh, it's terrible. And it was uh, was terrible for us then, because you always want to beat Mansfield, you want to beat Mansfield for the fans and uh, for yourself. But we got uh, beat there and say we weren't doing very well. And we had an inquest in the dressing room at Mansfield. Where John said, John saying, look, all of you say say what you think, we'll say what we think and we need to get it all out of the open. It was very, 
very forward. That John, John was a bit beyond his time, I think, where he wanted all the players to chip in and say he wanted them to work the problem out a lot of the time, not just give them the answer himself and uh, or what he thought was the answer. So we had a good discussion. All the senior pros, obviously Nicky Law and that, had a good talk about it and everybody had the two penneth worth and then we went on, I think we changed the system to a five at the back and uh, we went on a great run. I don't think we lost again till Carlisle, which was the penultimate game of the season. Yeah, and then it it kind of Mansfield come back around again, don't they? In the in the set, yeah. Um, yeah. Must have been uh, must have been nice to. <laughs> was it nice to play Mansfield in in that kind of? Because obviously it, it ramps up even more pressure, doesn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it puts you it puts you under pressure more because um, you play Mansfield, and it was it, it was a bit of a tough one for us because we we had such a good run. I mean, as you say, momentum and confidence in football. We used to go out in that run in games and we just never thought about losing. We never thought we'd get beat. We always thought we were going to get a result. If not win the game, we were disappointed if we drew. We were, I mean, Walsall were up there in the league and we went to their place and destroyed them 3-1. And everything, every game we were just so confident. We just... It wasn't arrogance. It was just we just didn't think we were going to lose. We just had the momentum behind us. And then to lose to Carlisle, who won the league, and miss out on automatic promotion, really, because mm. <coughs> we should have taken um, probably second spot in that league, um, deflates us a little bit, actually, coming into the Mansfield game. Because then we had the last game of the season was Colchester, where we just got 2-2. So... And that was at home. So we'd had a defeat and a draw. So then people saying, well, they haven't won in two, which isn't a massive thing. But after we'd, how we'd gone from um, Christmas time, December time before, it was, we were a little bit deflated. And then obviously you look at the playoffs and we were oh, a lot of points clear of Mansfield that season. Double figures. Easy. It was, I think it might have been 70, 70, it was 17, something like that. It was a lot of points clear in Mansfield, so we're thinking, well, we deserve to be obviously promoted more than Mansfield, but we know football doesn't work like that in the playoffs, and we knew it'd be a tough game, and it was it was a it was a pressure game for us, real pressure game, because one, you're not going to lose to Mansfield, and two, you want to get what you think you deserve, which was promotion that season. Mm-hmm. And I think we got a one-all draw down at their place. Um, and then it was the big night at Saltergate, which from, I think it was 17th of May, which actually was my birthday. <laughs> present. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a good present in the end. And here's Morris. Trying to tee someone else up. And it's surely a goal. It's to be. And Chesterfield are on their way to Wembley. And then, the game. and then, yeah, a chance to play at Wembley must just be everyone's dream. Yeah, I mean, again, sort of when I got interested in football, I think the first FA Cup final I can remember watching was Fulham. Was it Fulham West Ham? Something like that. 74, 75, one of those years. And in those days, the FA Cup final was a full day, a full day on telly. We mm-hmm. used to we filming outside the football team hotel. Um, players used to sit right out the bedroom window and talk to the press. And you got the coach down, you saw the Twin Towers. And for me, obviously, wanting to play for Chesterfield, wanting to play on Saltergate, but then ultimately getting the chance to play at Wembley was, it was phenomenal. It was an amazing, amazing feeling. Yeah. And it probably sounds like a bit of a silly question, but does... As, as someone that's like been to Wembley to obviously watch Chesterfield, does it as a player does it it feel a lot bigger? <laughs> like, does the pitch seem so much bigger? Does the because obviously Saltergate 
uh, is a, a lot smaller than yeah. Wembley. You know, do, do you get the that sense of everything just being much bigger? I think yeah. I think I think the first time we went, well, we went, we went under Paul Hart, um, nineteen ninety, and we went down the day before, the night before, um, and we stayed the night after, and um, sort of. Me personally, obviously I was younger then or whatever, but it was it was a bit of a mistake, not by the football club and not by the manager, but because when we went the second time, we went two days before and we had a tour of Wembley on the Thursday. You get a tour in the afternoon, you can go around, look at the dressing rooms you're in. We didn't do this the first time, so when you get there, you're sort of, wow, mm. this is Wembley. And you're a bit in awe of it and you're looking around at the changing rooms thinking, Think of all the players who've been in these changing rooms and on this pitch, and then you're walking out onto the pitch and you're thinking, look, at this is where you used to see all your heroes playing football. Mm. <coughs> and I think that that was tough the first time. I mean, we still gave a good fist of it in the game and we should have won it with the chances we had, but the second time we went, I think we were more prepared mentally. Um, I think the mind was on the game Um We'd been round the I'll say on the Thursday. Most of us went, looked at the changing rooms that we'd be in, knew when we got off the bus where we were going exactly, which changing rooms, where we were coming out, what we we're going to do. The mind was just on the game, and um, I think that is a lot. That's a lot in football, obviously the mental side of it. But uh, you do, if you don't do that sort of bit of it, especially the first time we went, I think you do think like on the Thursday when we went all round, you think, wow, look at this. And you look at the seating, I mean, 90,000 seater arena where you look at Salter Gate and you think, a little bit different to this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the play surface is always immaculate. But uh, it was it was a dream come true for me. And you do think everything's bigger. The Nets look bigger at Wembley because they've got those big back stanchions, the you know, iconic back stanchions on them. But uh, the, uh, the Nets look bigger. We still managed to put two in there to get through in that game anyway. Chesterfield are promoted to Division 2. They get their just desserts. The side that finished in third position in the table is promoted. A huge smile on the face of their captain and their inspiration, Nicky Law. He brought them to Wembley. They conquered at Wembley. And he receives the trophy and his own personal medal from Mike Naylor, Managing Director of Ensley Insurance. Chesterfield are promoted to Division 2. Yeah, and then I suppose I uh, have to whiz on to a few years later to kind of the FA Cup run. Um, yeah. So did that, did that Wembley did that Wembley win kind of put you in put you in good stead for for when the the games got a bit bigger in that FA Cup run? I think so. I think so. I mean, um, as I say, the second trip, I mean, I, mean I'm, I consider myself extremely lucky being a a lower league player, League 1, League 2 player throughout my career, who have two Wembley appearances, um, is, is amazingly lucky and I'll treasure it for the rest of my life. But... Um, and then the big games in the FA Cup. Yeah, we had a we had a good team there. We had a very strong, strong unit of a team that uh, John and Kevin had built through the seasons. We had a strong, strong unit when we got through Wembley. But then, obviously, we got up into League One and held our own quite comfortably for a couple of seasons in League One with some decent teams in. And um, as you say, the 96-97, when the FA Cup run started, it was... Uh, Again, we're building momentum. We're building momentum in that, and the momentum was coming from the town, the fans, everything, because it felt like it was everybody all together. Yeah, I, I, I remember listening to the the Nottingham Forest match on the radio because we uh, we weren't there, and uh, and yeah, that cup run was just was just bonkers, wasn't it? Did did, did you at, at what point did you were you only ever thinking about that next game and? Um, because, because you played kind of a, a various different teams, didn't you, of different stature kind of throughout. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
yeah, we yeah, we got a good we got a good run through. We got um, a lot of home games, a lot of home draws, um, which helped us, I think. Um, but we had a good team. We had a good a good solid team with some good players in it, some big characters in it. Um, but most importantly, we had a a team that would do anything for anybody. If one player was having an off day, somebody else would help cover, and then the next time it might be somebody else's turn. But we were we were a strong team, sort of on and off the pitch. We uh, we went out together off the pitch. We had a lot of nights out. Obviously, after the FA Cup runs and stuff like that, we had some good nights out. But we were a team together. We were always we were always strong. We were stronger as eleven than we were a two, three, or four, if you know what I mean. So we had a very good, very good squad and a very tight squad then. And um, and as I say, the draw was kind to us sometimes, a lot of home games, but the obviously Bolton away was a tough one. Mm. Well, they were all tough games. There they wasn't an easy game in it. But we had quite a good league season that season as well. We wouldn't have been, I don't. I think without the FA Cup, we wouldn't have been far off the playoffs for that, that season. We were doing well. And um, we had a terrible FA Cup record, Chesterfield. Um, I mean, mine must be terrible, except for that run, to be fair, because... <laughs> It must be. It must be basically round one because we won in. We got through round one again. Bury at home, where we would <coughs> played at Wembley in the um, in the playoff final. We beat them Bury at home, which was a tough, tough opening game for us. And we won that one nil. Um, with Mark Williams with a header from a corner, and uh, that was a cup run really for us. We were in round two. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was a bonus. <laughs> that used to be, yeah, that used to be our shopping Christmas shopping weekend round two, and all Chesterfield fans, I think, because we never, never, we hardly ever got there. And that's, I think John put in his program notes. I think John put, um, it's about time this club had a decent cup run because we're always out in round one, and uh, and to get to round two, and then to actually win in round two and make it to round three, that was definitely a cup run for Chesterfield mm. because. I would say, as a player, I think that's probably the only time I've been to round three. And it's probably, you know, <laughs> the record since has been pretty di- diabolical, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, we had a decent one. I think we get to round four with Derby County. We played Derby with Paul Cook and Paul Cook was here. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, yeah, it's been diet. And we, we were, I think, well, easily one of the worst in the football league for FA Cup. And uh, but this one, as you say, again, it was it was momentum in a way. It just sort of took off, um, beat Scarborough, and then again another top one, Bristol City, who were a big team in our league. Mm. But it sort of momentum took off, and then when it came round to, uh, as you say, the Bolton one was postponed a few times. Ended up being a night game, but uh, that was the one where I th- we had nothing really to lose then because Bolton were a good team. They were. Flying high, they were getting, they were going, they were in the Premiership the season after, and that was a nothing to lose one, and uh, that was a Kev Davies magic evening that one, and uh, he got his hat trick and won the game for us really. But then again, after that one, which was the Forest one, the momentum, like we said before, momentum sort of picked up, um, built up, and I think it was everything. It was the it was the club, the players, all the staff. And the fans, everything was sort of driving us on in the FA Cup. It was the fans were a massive part of it. I mean, as I say, we had a few nights out, and we'd go out and have a beer with the fans and a lot of the players and mingle with the fans at that time. And it was a big that was a big thing for for everything that got they they played as big a part in the cup run as we did in a way, sort of with the energy they produced through the town and through the club for us. It was. Uh, it was an amazing time. It was just a number of fairy tale time, really, yeah. for footballers, for me from Chesterfield and lower league footballers to go on a run like that. And your was, and your your goal in the in the Middlesbrough match, it's I don't think you get enough credit for for how technically hard that head up because it's it's bounced, hasn't it? And it's coming back up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, was that tricky? I, obviously. I obviously get a lot of stick for it, saying, oh, it just hit you on the head. <laughs> um, and I promise you now, I did mean to head it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, it was the pace on the ball. I mean, if you look at the crossing off Chris, it was 
a phenomenal cross. Because again, we're talking about big pitches. The Man United pitch is a big pitch. Old Trafford mm. is a big wide pitch. And uh, Chris, when you look at the angle he's coming to the ball, you think how he generated the power to get that ball in there was um, absolutely amazing. And the surface is obviously second to none, being Old Trafford, and it just skidded off the surface. It really took off. The ball had the pace on it when it came through. It skidded off. And I just, it was one of those where it's like, it's like a lot of goals. You just, I had the momentum of the run, which helped me sort of knock Curtis Fleming as I went up for the header. It made me look really strong, which was quite good because we're never the strongest player. <laughs> but uh, the momentum just took me into him. And I, it was one of those surreal moments where I could see the ball all the way. I just saw it all the way and where he talked to head the ball, right on the front of the forehead, that's exactly where I caught it. And as soon as I headed it, and it hit me, I say, exactly where, where, you'd, where you'd want the head, header to hit you. I'm thinking, that's got a chance. I'm thinking, that's not far off. And uh, the rest, as you say, just sort of, it was slow motion. It sort of just looped over Ben Roberts. And uh, it was... Um, it was probably in the top corner, I think, because it was it looped in. Yeah, and that'll never, that'll kind of never happen again, will it? A, a team, you you can't really see the FA Cup nowadays um, having a, having a team from a, a lower division getting that. Far. I can't, no, no, I can't see it happening again, and and a semi final like that, really. I mean, we're all obviously in Chesterfield. We're a little bit biased towards it, but. It's it's going to be, if not the best, one of the best that's out there semi final wise. I know there's been some great semi finals or whatever, but for a, a League Two team and a Premiership team with the array of stars they had, okay, not doing the brilliance in the Premiership that season, but they still had a a lot of talent and a lot of money spent in that team. It, there was, I don't think there's anything the game was missing. They disallowed goal that. Might have done the fairy tale and took us to Wembley and the sending off and then them coming back and then us equalising and it's it's just if that was probably on the big screen the people wouldn't say well that's a bit far fetched that game mm. because of what it had in it it was just and to be there sort of on the pitch I mean you you do any job on the pitch you don't notice the severity of it so much when you're on there but when you watch it back or clips of it it's goosebumps you know what I mean it's it's amazing. Yeah, and there's obviously, like like as you mentioned, there's a, a bittersweet element to it, to it, isn't there? With the with the disallowed, well, the not given goal. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Looking back, is that still bittersweet for you, or 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 have you kind of settled with that now? Um, it's a, bit, a little bit, bit. It's still a bit like that because. Another Wembley appearance in an FA Cup final would have been would have been amazing. So it is it does great on you quite a bit because you can't understand what they're thinking. It's it's it just it just beggars belief for what they're thinking on why they didn't well the linesman gave it. The linesman ran off. He gave yeah, it. he ran off, didn't he? Back to the so why he didn't keep his flag up and call the ref over. I don't know. It wasn't a time where you sort of surrounded a ref and like they tend to now and it wasn't a time we didn't do that. We thought, all right, must have seen something, got on with it. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough one sometimes to look at and, um, and take. Good early cross. Very good early cross. to go, Leicester equalise, seven days later, what can only be a minute to go, and yet again, they find a way through, and it's a hopeful ball up, they allow it to bounce, but look at that for a header, that's just unsavable, you don't save it, it's as simple as that, ball played in, they don't deal with it, 
But look at that for a header. Jamie Hewitt. Well, you could not in a million years have envisaged a match like this between sides as Sean Duncan even loses his glasses in the uh, jubilation. Nil-nil at half-time. 2-2 two -two at regulation time. 3-2 halfway through extra time. And in the nick of time, Jamie Hewitt keeps Chesterfield in the FA Cup. It's a replay at Hillsborough on April the 22nd. And no wonder there are mutual <laughs> congratulations all round. God, enjoy it, lads. Enjoy. What a tale has unfolded here. First of all, Middlesbrough, it seems, shooting themselves in the foot. Kinder getting himself sent off. And if you like, that it brought the odds closer together. And after Andy Morris had given Chesterfield the lead, Sean Dyche stepped up to slam in the penalty. 2-0. But Middlesbrough found the resolve. They had Ravanelli, 2-1. They had a Hignett penalty, 2-2. And then, as we wondered which way it would turn, Fester put them in front. And Middlesbrough, in extra time, were pipped at the post at the or caught at the post, should I say, by Leicester last Sunday, and they've been caught at the post by Jamie Hewitt of Chesterfield. Wow, that's... Chris Beaumont's that. cross. Yeah. That's mine, says Hewitt. Unforgettable. So then, kind of, it was your testimonial season then, wasn't it? A couple of years after that. Um, yes. Did you... Did you kind of in, enjoy it at the time, the testament. Do you get to, do you kind of think about it, it being your testimonial season? Or, or just um, yeah, it's a tough season. It's tough to play when you play, you know, having a testimonial season with your events and trying to organise things. And you don't, you don't tend to enjoy it too much, you know, but uh, it's nice to be honoured by the football club. And uh, the game at the end is always nice when the fans are there and appreciate that you've been there 10 years and played so many games and, give your all for the club really so a club that you a club that I love and uh, it's nice to see people there just saying a thank you in a way and just coming to watch a game yeah and me to say thank you for them for their support through the through the seasons as well one of one of the questions i really wanted to ask was what was a typical uh john duncan training week like so so it's monday today imagine you've got a match on a saturday Take, right, so if we had a full build up with John, yeah, I mean John was very meticulous. He was, uh, we always used to enjoy a five a side or a game like that, but John never let us play them. <laughs> so uh, <coughs> a Monday it tend to be, it probably all depends how the Saturday went, but if it was unusual, if we'd done well or whatever, you'd have your normal training session. We'd be doing a bit of a warm up, and then um, John liked his eleven v elevens and a lot of team shape and. It was all, always thinking a lot of managers sort of build the training up to your Thursday where you're then doing your opposition work and stuff like that. But John was doing opposition work at least Tuesdays, um, things like that, even Mondays sometimes. So Monday could be a, a tough session because we usually have the Sunday off, so it would be a tough uh, a tough session, mainly ball work, um, but 11 v 11 and gaining repossessions from midfield and playing the ball up to strikers, getting a repossession on midfield, moving up. There's a lot of technical stuff and how he wanted us to play. Um, and that would usually just be probably a morning session on the Monday. Um, probably start at 10 ish, finish about half 12, one o'clock, something like that. Uh, moving on to Tuesday, that was usually a, your hard session. Um, that would usually consist of running, some running in it. Um, depending on what ball work stuff we wanted to do, we might do that in the afternoons. But uh, we'd have a tough, a tough running session probably on a Tuesday fitness. Um, he'd like to like to find some hills and uh, runners up there or up and down the stands and stuff like that. It was uh, Tuesday usually was a tough day. Um, Wednesday was a rest usually. Wednesday was usually off. The majority, probably the players who weren't in the first team, we're probably back in on the Wednesday doing a little bit for a couple of hours, but 
the majority of the day off. And then Thursday was down to, again, quite a longer session, but tactics on how we're going to play against the opposition for Saturday. Really getting into it now, probably doing a few set pieces if he changed them, uh, things like that, really getting um, into it. Um, but then again, just one session, but quite a long, intense one. And then Friday would be the shortest one of the week. Um, a warm-up, bit of ball work. Um, and again, probably a bit of shape, a bit of pattern of play on how he wanted us to play in and out of possession. Um, finishing off with set pieces, corners four, corners against, three kicks four, three kicks against, um, things like that. And then usually maybe finish off with a, a few sprints or a bit of uh, trying to sharpen the mind up a few sprints just to... Uh, finish the session but that would probably last an hour hour and a quarter at most on a Friday and then they'd get you off and um, prepare for the Saturday then became physio didn't you and that's how yeah, that's yeah. How some, some fans may remember you more as the physio than player depending on when they started to probably yeah in, probably yeah now into the ground and stuff how did that how did that kind of all come about um, well I was coming to the end I was coming into my 30s and um, I was interested in staying in and not so much on the coaching side, but uh, the FA had some good courses on um, sports therapy and physiotherapy at the time. So um, I enrolled in some of those and then um, they were over about three or four years. So I enrolled in those, they were part-time and um, managed to get qualifications through there, um, through the um, FA um, for a sports therapist. And then, uh, and then as my career was coming to an end, the chairman at the time was um, Norton Lee and uh, Nicky Law was manager. Nicky Law had just taken over as manager mm-hmm. and asked me if I'd do the youth team, if I'd stay on, do a bit of the youth team physio in and be a part-time player and do the physio in. So that was a great role for me to get into. Didn't play too many games, but uh, trained most days, got a couple of days off to do rehab with the youth team and um, played a few games when they were short, when they had an injury crisis and then... Um, Obviously, Nicky left and went to uh, Bradford. Um, and Dave Rush took over, who was physio at the time. So they asked me if I'd step up to first team while he was there. So I stepped up and stayed there for a while. Do you, as as physio, do you become are you are you much of much as like a therapist as, as you are a physio? Because you're obviously working with players, aren't you? That have um, that might have different severities of injuries. Do you kind of become a yeah. confidant to those yeah. players? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, you become a sort of someone to talk to, someone to listen to. Um, and yeah, you're a go between. You're you sort of you got your foot in one bus of the camp and a foot in the other bit of the camp, really. And you have to be be careful what uh, what you let out sometimes, you know, what the players are telling you. And because the manager wants to know everything, but you've got to use discretion on what even you tell the manager and what uh, the manager's told you about the player. So sort of, you've got to keep their confidence up and keep their spirits high because it's a tough time for a player when they're injured as well. So uh, your um, it's mental side of it as well. You've got to keep them in good spirits and you've got to be good to be trusted. You've got to be trusted by by sort of everybody at the club, on the playing side and in the management side that uh, on what you're doing. So it's not to, it can be tough sometimes, but you've got to do it um, how you feel fit and feel best. And there must be those players that that kind of have recurring injuries or just bad luck. And I don't know, do you do you kind of, are you sat on the sidelines thinking, oh no, not again, when, you know, a player yeah. gets a recurring injury? Because Definitely. And it's a, it's a theme in football. Uh, I don't know. Nobody knows why. Nobody ever will know why, I don't think. But some players tend to pick up injuries a lot easier than others. You get some players will play 40 games a season, bang, 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 keep playing. Hard to pick up an injury and where some just go on the pitch and pick them up and then they're out for two or three games, come back, they're out for two or three games. And it's just, it's the way the bodies are made or whichever. It's, it, just, it happens in football and you'll never stop it. You, you, you'll never stop it. You can condition a player as best you can and as best they can and hopefully reduce it as much as you can, but you'll you'll never stop. It's just part and parcel of football, I think. There are some players who unfortunately do get injured more than others. Yeah, and it must be tough, like mentally tough when 
your hobby becomes your profession and then yeah. you get an injury in your profession that then means you can't enjoy your hobby as well that must be yeah. as, as, as I mean you'll experience injuries does that is that really tough on your mental health when you're kind of going through that yeah it's tough because you're paid to be out on the pitch and that's what you want to be doing as you say it's, uh, it's from a hobby to, to doing it you still enjoy doing it and you've got an injury that stops you doing it it's uh, when you're fit and running around and playing you just think well that's normal that's what I do then all of a sudden injury stops it and it's like I can't do it and you have to sit back and it's a slow process to build up to getting fit again on a muscle injury or any sort of injury it's a slow process So, so looking ahead, kind of the the club seems to be on a little bit of an up again after after many years of being on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Are you kind of confident now, looking forward that the club's pointing? I think so. Back? I mean, I've wa- I'm watching all the games on the streams at the minute and uh, enjoying them. Highlights of the week, watching a bit of football, and I'm lucky enough to do a bit of a uh, bit of the commentary down at the ground when they do it, some of it, the summarising, hmm. and it's lovely to see a game live. I mean, can't wait till the fans can get back in and uh, see it for themselves. But as the club's going, I think, yes, I think um, they chose wisely in the manager, I think. I think he seems to be doing a good job. Um, he's got players who are playing how he wants them to play. He's, he's getting the right fit players for him. Rather than just saying, oh, that he's a good player, we'll have him. He's got players who are the right fit for him and for the way he wants to play. And um, ultimately, the football club. So it's exciting to watch. to play some good football. Um, and it's hopefully onwards and upwards now we can uh, get some momentum going and uh, get back to seeing Chester with fans smiling again on a Saturday about half past four quarter to five yeah let's hope so it'd be nice because they deserve it because the fans have been brilliant all the way through and um, and my final question which is the most important one obviously um, the Saltergate or the Technique which, which stadium would you choose? Um, for me, it's, I mean, you can't stop progress and the technique is progress for Chesterfield, but growing up in older grounds myself and obviously watching Saltergate, it's got to, I've got to give it to Saltergate because it's my, where I went from the age of four or five to watch Chesterfield and I'm lucky and I would never forget how lucky I am to play there after watching because that's what I wanted to do mm. um, and I'll never take it for granted it's something something I wanted to do when I was I say growing up seven eight nine and luckily I did it and I'm playing under lights which when I went to night games like I said earlier I wanted to do and there uh, but I can the, the technique is is a is progress it's a, a state of the art we want to have the England games at Saltergate I suppose like we Mm-hmm. get now and things like that but uh, I like the uh, I like the characteristic of the old ground and okay it wasn't uh, wasn't the most comfy seats to sit on watching the games or wherever they stood and the changing rooms weren't the uh, most salubrious surroundings in the country but it was it was a it had it had character and I, I love it I'll always love looking at photos of it and I loved playing there and loved working there. So yeah, it was a great round. Cool. Well, yeah. Thanks very yeah. much for chatting to us, and uh, hopefully no we'll. Be, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Hopefully we'll be back at the ground soon to actually actually watch a match <laughs> live. Yeah. With all the fans. Hopefully, hopefully we can uh, get back, get all the fans in, and uh, have a couple of pints and watch the football. <laughs>